Good morning, and welcome to our Easter service here at the Orchard, where we celebrate in a very focused way the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I've been asked to interrupt this call to worship and tell you to squeeze together towards the middle. There are still more people coming. Just move towards the center. If there's empty chairs or a chair was just vacated because of how many moved, please do it. Look, nobody's doing it. Nobody's doing it. I told you nobody would do it. Not a single one of you moved, but there's space. All right. Happy Easter. He is risen. Indeed. On Friday night, we heard the biblical account of Jesus' suffering, especially his suffering on the cross, where he said seven things, seven grace-filled, life-giving sayings, and maybe the best one, I think my favorite, he said, it is finished. Sin which had separated us from a holy God had been dealt with once for all so that all who bow the knee to Jesus can have eternal life. We hear con confirmation that Jesus' work is finished in Romans 6 where we read, we know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he now, he now lives, he lives to God. And there's also good news in that, pastor, in that passage for all who have been identified to him by faith. It says, for if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. Well, let's hear the gospel account of the resurrection of Jesus from Luke chapter 24. But on the first day of the week at early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared, and they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise. And they remembered his words and returning from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest.
Now, it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary, the mother of James, and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. But these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. But Peter rose and ran to the tomb. Stooping and looking in, he saw the linen cloths by themselves, and he went home marveling at what had happened.
Please be seated. In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul writes, I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. And a little later he says, if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. Amen? Amen. Let's bow our heads and pray together. Heavenly Father, we are gathered here in your presence this morning to celebrate the resurrection of your son, Jesus Christ. And the entirety of our salvation, including our forgiveness, including our hope in this life and in the life to come, is all bound up in these facts that Christ died for our sins and that Christ rose again. He is our living Savior. He is seated at your right hand, reigning in power and authority over all things, and he is coming again soon to restore all things and to rescue us from this fallen world. God, there is nothing greater than the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus our Lord. May your spirit open the eyes of our hearts today to know him more and the power of his resurrection. Father, for those here today who do not yet believe, who have yet to see the glory of Christ, please give the gift of faith And for those of us here with weak faith, wavering faith, full of doubts and uncertainties, strengthen our trust in Christ today. And for those of us here today worn down from the struggle with sin, weary from the sorrows of this world, increase our joy and increase our confidence in the future resurrection life that you have promised. When death will be no more, Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for these things will have all passed away. God, we praise you for the resurrection, and we pray these things in the mighty name of our risen Savior, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, happy Easter, everyone, and welcome to the Orchard. It's so good to be together for worship today. We are glad that you're here. Uh, If you are a guest with us this morning, we're glad that you've come. My name is Brad Weatherall. I have the privilege of serving as the campus pastor here, and we would love the opportunity to meet you. Uh, We also have a small gift we'd love to give you if you'd stop at our welcome desk in the lobby right after the service today. We'd love to have you join us again. Our regular worship services take place each Sunday at 8 o'clock, 9.30, and 11 o'clock a.m., and uh, we hope that the orchard will be a place uh, where you can grow in faith, where you can abound in hope, and where you can walk in love. Uh, We grow together here as we dig deep roots into God's Word, especially as we gather like this to sing and to pray and to read and to sit under the preaching of His Word together. We grow as we share the life we have in Christ together. Uh, This is why we have life groups here that provide a small group context to study the Bible, to pray for one another, and to encourage each other. And we grow as we bear fruit for God's glory here in our church and around our world. And so if you are in need of a church home, uh, we would love for you to keep coming and to grow with us here at the Orchard. Also, whether you're new or you've been here for a while now and you are a believer in Jesus but you've not yet been baptized... Uh, We would love to celebrate your baptism in one of our worship services at the end of the month. Baptism will 
bless you as you make this public profession of faith in Christ. It will encourage all of us who get to witness your baptism and celebrate that with you. And of course, it will be honoring and glorifying to Jesus. Uh, You can head to our church's website and fill out a baptism request form to get that process started. Or please reach out to any member of our pastoral team uh, with questions. We'd be glad to talk with you more about baptism. During this next song, I'd encourage all of you to take a moment and go to the church website or open up the church's app and find our online connection card. Uh, Fill that out. Let us know you worshiped with us today, whether you're brand new here or you've been here for a long time. And you also see a spot in there where you can leave a prayer request. Let us know how uh, our team can pray for you this week. We love to serve you in that way each and every week. Uh, You can also use this next song as an opportunity uh, to give to the Lord as an act of worship, and uh, you can do that online as well, or if you brought a physical offering with you, there will be boxes in the lobby right after the service. Uh, But church, as we give, let's remember the Son of God loved us and gave himself for us, and so in response to his generosity and his gift of grace, let's give with hearts of joy and gratitude today.
Amen. Please remain standing for the reading of God's word and turn to Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24, verses 13 to 35. And you'll find that on page 885 of the Church Bible. That very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. And while they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what is this conversation that you are holding with each other as you walk? They stood still, looking sad. Then one of them named Cleopas answered him, are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened th the, there in these days? And he said to them, what things? And they said to him, concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things happened. Moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning, and when they did not find his body, they came back saying that they had even seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. And he said to them, O oh, foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So they drew near to the village to which they were going. He acted as if he was going further, but they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at table with them, he took the bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened and they recognized him. And he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? And they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem. And they found the eleven and those who were with them gathered together, saying, The Lord has risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. This is the word of God. You may be seated. Well, happy Easter, everyone. The Easter message this year is entitled, Finding Hope Again. And I hope you'll have your Bible open, if you have one, at Luke and chapter 24, the story that's been read for us. It begins in verse 13, where we're told that that very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. So here we have a story 
that took place on the day that Jesus rose from the dead, that very day. And Luke refers to two of them. So, these two were uh, not among the inner group of the disciples, but they were among the broader circle of those who had been drawn to Jesus and had believed in Him. Now, it's often assumed that these were two men, but it is equally possible that they may have been a married couple, a husband and a wife who believed in Jesus, and I'm going to assume that that was the case. And it seems that they lived in this town that was called Emmaus, and that they had gone to Jerusalem, presumably to celebrate the Passover. Perhaps they had been in Jerusalem on Palm Sunday a week earlier. They had felt like a, a carnival on that occasion, uh, Jesus riding into the city on a donkey, uh, people throwing uh, palm branches on the road in front of Him and cheering and shouting, blessed is He who comes in the name of the Lord. I mean, it was a day that was just filled with hope, anticipation, expectation, and joy. But within the week, the carnival had turned into a riot, and in the week when God's people celebrated their freedom, the most sickening violence had been unleashed. Jesus had been crucified, and now this couple's hope was gone. They say in verse 21, we had hoped that He was the one to redeem Israel. We had hoped. Now, I think that this is a story then that speaks directly to where we are today. There are many who at one time professed to believe in Jesus, but no longer have hope in Him. And I want to speak especially today to those who once hoped in Jesus, but hope in Him no longer. We had hoped. And I want to show from this story today how it is that Jesus leads people to find hope again. And there are five stages in this story. The first is that Jesus draws near. Verse 15, while they were talking and discussing together, Jesus Himself drew near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing Him. So, Jesus drew near to this couple, but they didn't recognize that it was Him. As far as they were concerned, this was a stranger who joined them on their journey. And the stranger asks them, what's this conversation that you're having, the one with the other? And when the stranger asked them this, they just stopped right there in the road, stood absolutely still. And Luke records that they were looking sad. By the way, I, I have noticed that there is often a deep sadness about people who once hoped in Jesus. And this couple tell the reason for their sadness. They tell their story. We had hoped that He was the one to redeem Israel. Now, why had they lost hope? Well, I think there are some clear indications in the story. And I want you to notice, therefore, that Jesus draws near to people who have been let down by their own religious leaders. See, the stranger asks them what they're talking about. They tell him that they are talking about Jesus. Then they say, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. Now, you see what they're saying? Our chief priests and our rulers have let us down. They have acted in a shameful manner. These were people who were put in a position of trust. And these trusted men who were supposed to serve us, what have they done? Instead of walking with God, which was their calling, they have done an evil thing. They have crucified Jesus, and now, therefore, we have lost hope. Now, maybe you can relate to that. There are way too many stories 
of religious leaders who have betrayed the trust that has been put in them. And maybe you have experienced that, and it has affected you very, very deeply, and because of it, you have lost hope. And do you see that in this story, that is precisely where this couple on the road to Emmaus were when Jesus drew near to them? He draws near to people who have been let down, deeply disappointed by their own leaders. Second, it's very clear here that Jesus draws near to people who have been confused by other believers. Look at verse 22, the account that they give of what happened on Easter morning. Moreover, they say, some women of our company amazed us They were at the tomb early in the morning, and when they did not find his body, they came back saying that they had even seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it was just as the women had said, but him they did not see. So, it's very clear then that this couple were in the broader circle of disciples on Easter morning. They talk about our company. They talk about those who were with us going to the tomb. And so, they give us another witness to what actually happened on that morning. Some women had gone to the tomb early. They had found that the tomb was empty. They said that they had seen a vision of angels. So, this couple evidently were with the disciples when the women brought this report back. And so, some of those who were with us, they say, that would have been Peter and John, went to the tomb. They found, of course, that the tomb was empty, but they did not see Jesus. And so, now this couple are confused. I mean, these, they, these women certainly seem to have had a remarkable experience but then nothing like that happened for Peter or for John, and nothing like that has happened for us. And so, again, maybe you can relate to this. You, you listen to believers talking about their experience, and sometimes you find yourself confused. You say, well, something remarkable has happened to them, but nothing miraculous has ever happened to me. And so, you begin to think, well, perhaps this whole faith thing isn't for me. Well, do you see that that is just where this couple were on the road to Emmaus when Jesus drew near to them? He draws near to people who've been let down. He draws near to people who have found themselves confused. And then it's very clear here that Jesus draws near to people who struggle with what has happened. Look at verse 18. Then one of them named Cleopas answered him, are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? Now, that's it, the things that have happened. Now, you see, this couple knew that Jesus was a prophet mighty in word and deed. He had the power to still a storm. He had the power to heal the sick. He had the power to raise the dead. So, why then had He allowed His own crucifixion? Well, you see, behind this loss of hope, there really was a painful question, why did Jesus allow this to happen. That's where they were. I was speaking just the other week with a couple in our congregation. They were going to visit their son, who's now in his mid-30s, and they asked me to pray for their son. He used to believe, they said, but now he is an ardent atheist. I asked them what had happened And the father said, you know, I think it all began when I got cancer. He said, my son was a teenager at the time, and he just kept asking, why would God allow this to happen? Now, again, maybe you can relate to this. You had hoped in Jesus. 
You had prayed to Jesus. You believed that Jesus has the power to do what you asked, but He didn't do it. And you can't figure out why Jesus would allow what has happened in your life. Behind unbelief, you will often find a painful question. If Jesus really is God with us, how could He allow this to happen? Do you see again that that is precisely where this couple on the road to Emmaus were when Jesus drew near to them? Jesus has a special interest in those who used to believe. He draws near to people who have lost hope. Isn't it striking that one of the very first resurrection appearances of Jesus was to people who had been let down by their leaders, to people who were confused by others who believe, to people who were struggling to figure out what has happened? And the striking thing about this story is that Jesus was actually right there with them in their struggle, even though they didn't know it. He was nearer to this couple who had lost hope than either of them could ever have imagined, and right now He is nearer to you than you might ever have thought. Jesus draws near. That's how He brings us to find hope again. And I want you to notice what he does when he draws near. Jesus identifies the problem. Verse 25, he said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Now, these words really come as something of a shock and a surprise. Jesus has been drawing out the reasons for their sadness, the reasons why they have lost hope. He's listening as they tell the whole story. And now it's as if Jesus says to them, now I've heard you, and I've taken in everything that you have said, and all of it is true. You have been let down by your own leaders. You have been confused by others who believe and you have struggled to make any sense of what has happened. All of these things are true, but there's something else. There's another factor in your losing hope, and that factor lies in your own heart. It is that your heart is slow to believe. See, the heart of the human problem is the problem of the human heart. Yes, things happen that caused you to lose hope, but that's not the whole story. There is a problem in your heart for which you are responsible. And Jesus is making this perfectly clear. The reason that you have lost hope, it lies not only with what other people have said and done, it lies not only in the painful things that you have experienced, it lies also in the slowness of your own heart to believe. See, that is Jesus' diagnosis of the root problem. Your heart is slow to believe. Now, this could easily have been the end of the whole story. I mean, these are hard words to hear. And this couple might easily have taken offense and have separated from Jesus and made the rest of the journey home on their own. And if they had, they would have remained without hope. But thank God this couple made a better choice. They accepted the rebuke of Jesus, and they continued to walk with Him. And if you are to find hope again, this is what you must do. You must accept the rebuke of Jesus. You must accept the diagnosis that He gives of the problem in your own heart. You must recognize that your own heart is slow to believe, and you must ask Jesus, therefore, to help you 
There's a reluctance that's in you by nature when it comes to faith. When it comes to this, you drag your feet. That's just how it is. And this is a problem for which you must take responsibility. If you are to find hope again, recognize the problem and ask Jesus to help you. So here's how Jesus brings people to find hope again. He draws near and he identifies the problem. Then notice what he does next. Jesus focuses attention on himself. Verse 27, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Now, of course, every preacher wishes that he could hear uh, Jesus opening up the scriptures concerning himself. What passages did he use? Uh, what did he say about them? We're not told. But what we are told is this. We are told the main point that Jesus proved from the Old Testament scriptures, and it's in verse 26. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory. So, the Scriptures speak very clearly about a deliverer whose triumph would be glorious. But the Scriptures are also repeatedly clear that before entering into His glory, this mighty deliverer would suffer and He would die. He would be pierced for our transgressions. He would be crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that would bring us peace would be upon Him, and it would be by His wounds that we would be healed. Then He would rise from the dead. Then He would be received into heaven. Then He would be crowned with glory and with honor, and then He would return in triumph and in power. Now, Jesus showed them all of this in the Scriptures, and as He opened the Scriptures, faith began to dawn in their hearts and in their minds. Well, if this is true, then the suffering and death of Jesus would not be the end of hope, it would be the beginning. If this is true, then His crucifixion would not be the end of hope that He is the great Deliverer. It would actually be the decisive evidence that He is. Friends, Jesus Christ crucified and risen is the hope of a suffering and a sinful world. Jesus Christ crucified and risen is the hope of all whose hearts are slow to believe. Jesus Christ is the hope of all who have been let down, all who have been confused, and all who struggle to make any sense of what has happened. And this couple find hope again by focusing their attention on Jesus Himself. And if you are to find hope again, that is what you must do. Yes, there are people who let you down. Yes, there may have been believers who caused you confusion. Yes, there may be things that you cannot understand or explain, and yes, your heart is slow to believe, but here is where you can find hope. Hope is found in a person, and that person is Jesus Christ. Look at Him. Look at what the Scriptures say about Him. Look at how He fulfills all that God has promised, and look at what He promises to all who believe in Him. Here's how people find hope again. Jesus draws near. He identifies the problem. He focuses attention on Himself. And then the fourth thing that's very clear here is that Jesus provokes a decision. Notice verse 28. So, they drew near to the village to which they were going. He acted as if He were going further. But they urged him strongly, saying, stay with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them. So they arrive at Emmaus, which presumably was home for this couple. 
and the stranger acts as if he is going to go further. And of course, that provokes a decision. Now the couple have to make a choice. Either they can let him go, or they can ask him to stay. But there is clearly a decision here for them to make, and it is a decision that is provoked by the action of Jesus himself. He acted as if he were going further. Now, again, the story might have ended right here. Well, it's been very interesting talking with you about the Scriptures today. We found it very fascinating what you've said. We've enjoyed your company. Goodbye. And if that had been their decision, they would have remained without hope. When you have learned from Jesus, at some point He will bring you to a place where you have to make a decision. There will be for you a real choice that has to be made. Are you going to let Jesus go, or are you going to ask Him to stay? And if you are to find hope again, if you are to enter into the blessing that Jesus offers, if like this couple, uh, you are to receive what He gives, then you must ask Him to stay. And notice what it says, they urged Him strongly, saying, stay with us. And you know, the good news is, when you ask Jesus to stay, He stays he stays. Now, do you see how Jesus leads people to find hope again? He draws near, he identifies the problem, he focuses attention on himself, and then he provokes a decision. And then here's the last thing, Jesus makes himself known. Look at verse 31, their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. And he vanished from their sight, and they said to each other, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the Scriptures? So, as they come to Emmaus, and they ask Jesus to stay, Jesus comes into their home. They prepare a meal for this stranger. Still, they don't know who it is. Jesus, around the table, takes the bread, and He breaks it, and their eyes were opened, and they recognized Him. They saw the risen Lord. It's Him, the one who was opening the Scriptures, the one to whom we were speaking all these miles on the road. We never realized it was Him. He was actually walking with us. Now, the obvious reaction, I think, at this point in the story for us is to say, well, you know, that was great for them, but nothing like that has ever happened to me. I mean, if I could see the uh, risen Lord break bread uh, around my kitchen table, then for sure I would believe. But you see, I think that that is the significance of verse 32. You see, their eyes were opened, but then immediately Jesus vanished from their sight. And notice what they say next, did not our hearts burn within us while He talked to us on the road and while He opened to us the Scripture? Well, let me ask you to think about this. When did they come to faith? And let me suggest this answer. Faith was not born when they were eating round the table. Faith was born when they were walking in the road. The faith of this couple rested not on the appearance of Jesus that was unique to them, but on what the Scripture says about Jesus that is available to us all. Jesus makes Himself known to those who seek Him through the Scripture. And you have more Scripture than these disciples ever did. They had simply the Old Testament Scriptures that Jesus interpreted to them. But you see, you have the New Testament Scriptures that actually open up the meaning of the Old Testament Scriptures for you. That is why John says at the end of his gospel, these are written that you may believe 
that Jesus is the Christ, and that by believing, you may have life in His name. So, this wonderful story is a story for all who once hoped in Jesus. It's a story for all those who have been disappointed and let down, a story for those who have felt confused, a story for those who cannot make sense of what has happened. Jesus has a special interest in those who used to believe. And think about it, this couple began Easter Day without hope, but by the end of Easter Day, they had found hope again. Jesus drew near, and what He did on that first Easter, He still does today. Will you pray with me? Our prayer for every service is that Jesus Himself would draw near. And we've seen that when He does, He identifies the problem. Will you own before Him right now the problem that your own heart is slow to believe? And will you ask Him to help you? And we've seen that when Jesus draws near, He will bring a person to a point of decision. Do you want Him to stay, or are you going to let Him go? Would you make it on this Easter morning your prayer, Lord Jesus, stay. Stay, teach me. Stay, open my eyes. Stay, lead me and guide me. Stay and save me. Father, read where there is repentance and where there is faith in this congregation here this morning, and grant that we may not simply know about Jesus, but that we may come to know Him as our Savior, our Master, our Lord, our Redeemer, and our Friend, and that through Him we may find hope again, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Stand. Hallelujah. 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 Hallelujah.
May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that, that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. Amen. God bless you.